Hey, Grace Steele, welcome back. Sully here with my friend, associate, fellow coach, colleague, Hi, everyone. Uh, Noah Hayden. Uh, we've introduced Noah before. He uh, coaches um, um, blue team at Grace Steel, um, and um, he's one of the finest coaches in North America. And we are once again coming together for our semi-annual uh, Q&A. Mm -hmm. We're going to do this in two sections this time. Uh, we just filmed our maiden voyage of the form check video. We're going to see how that how that plays out. We hope you guys take a look at that too. And while we're at it, uh, we're going to do some Q&A. There's a link uh, in the description to uh, send us your questions, your comments, um, to give us uh, some raw material to work off on these, um, on these question and answer sessions. So without any further ado, first question is mine, mm -hmm. and it's from Steve Wally. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And Steve asks, hope you are doing well. Yeah, I guess so. We're doing okay. Um, and uh, <laughs> Steve asking. asks, is there a cutoff point in terms of weight gain to a master's lifter 60 plus, where the potential strength benefits are outweighed with risk to health, high BMI, et cetera? Best wishes, Steve. Yeah, sure. Sure there is. There's going to be some point, you know, if you come in and you're underweight and your lean body mass is low, even if you have like high body fat and your lean body mass is low, right? and you come in and you start doing a novice linear progression in a place like Gray Steel, you're gonna start by adding body weight because you're gonna be adding muscular weight and hopefully a little bit of bone as well, right? And so when you start a linear progression under the bar, that's no time to think about weight loss. You know, it, you maybe, you, you know, you wanna talk to your coach about nutrition and maybe moderating your fat and your sugar intake and being really, really smart about your carbohydrate intake and maximizing your protein intake uh, to promote strength gains under the bar. And you're going to gain some weight. Almost everybody's yeah. going to gain some weight when they first start, unless you are like obese. And if you're obese and we, you know, we optimize your macros and we get you to eat enough protein to sustain uh, strength increases and stuff like that, those people will lose weight. But sure, there's a point at which gaining weight doesn't really help you gain any more strength any more quickly and just becomes a challenge to your overall health. Yeah. And what is that point? I can't give you a number, right? So, you know, it, it, it's going to depend largely on you and your particular situation and what your particular training goals are. Truth be told, yeah, people who start here at a place like Graysteel, they're interested in improving their health and their ability to function, but nobody doesn't have a cosmetic uh, goal in the back of their mind. Everybody wants to look better. Everybody wants to look healthier. It's just that most of the people who come here are smart enough to realize that healthier looks better. Right? Right. So I can't give you a number, but I will tell you this. If you think that that number is associated with a particular BMI, you're barking up the wrong tree. BMI is just one of the single worst health metrics in history. It is just not a suitable metric for ascertaining ideal body weight or body composition. BMI is a tool that was developed for the statistical analysis of populations. It was never intended to be a clinical decision instrument, right? For individuals. For individuals, yeah. right? So sure, right? You, unregulated weight gain uh, when you begin your training is not good, right? And nobody should begin training without a conversation with their coach uh, about optimizing their nutrition, their protein intake, smart use of carbohydrates, and keeping their fat and sugar down to a dull roar. But I can't give you particular numbers. I can only confirm your suspicion that, yeah, there's a, there's a point at which gaining more weight not only has diminishing returns, but can have a negative impact on your health. Uh, I would say that for someone over 60, I, I agree with all of that. Uh, I would say that for a person over 60, deliberate weight gain is... I think a, a rare choice, a good choice, you know, it's, it's rarely a good choice, um, only because if you're deliberately trying to put on a lot of weight, let's say, 
um, which maybe is what this is this question is referring to. Um, a lot more of that is going to be fat. Like your rate of lean body mass uh, uh, increase is going to be a lot lower than a younger person's. Uh, I would recommend instead of trying to, let's say you're a frail person or you want to put on more lean body mass, um, I would recommend instead of thinking in terms of bringing your calories higher, uh, instead of that, just change the priorities of what foods you're eating and, and let, let that weight gain, if that's what happens, be a very slow, gradual thing. Organic, natural process. Right. right. Uh, because uh, if it's any faster than that, a lot of it's going to be fat. Like, let, I, I, it's hard to make generalizations here, but that's probably true for virtually everyone. Uh, and losing fat as an older adult it's harder. is way harder, <laughs> way harder. So there's no reason to do that to yourself. And, and again, um, if in the future you say, well, now I'm two years into strength training and I've gotten a lot stronger, but I put on 30 pounds of fat or something that I need to take off now, uh, uh, training while in a deficit is brutal. And so what's the point? You, you didn't have to do that to yourself. Um, if any weight needs to be gained for any person, for any lifter, uh, that's going to be a slow process that the body uh, can do that at for lean body mass. And so your total weight gain should really ideally not be higher than that. Um, so I would say just focus on getting enough protein, right? Having healthy meals, healthy components to your diet. And, and the weight gain will just sort of happen if it needs to happen. This, I, think this, I think this underscores um, the indication, particularly for older adults who are lifting for health and, and overall functional performance, um, of monitoring. So in our, um, in our new nutrition program uh, that we're, we're developing, the, just about the first habit that we ask people to build in is to monitor their intake and monitor their body composition, right? So if you start a training program and your lean body mass is going nowhere or is going down and your fat mass is going down too and you're like, yay, I'm losing weight, you've really lost the thread, right? You've, you've missed the point. And on the other hand, if you're, you're eating like crazy to support gains in strength and you're like a 63 year old and you're getting moderate improvements in lean body mass and huge improvements, huge increases in body fat, again, you have missed the point and there needs to be some adjustment and some macronutrient and caloric um, uh, recalibration. And I think what this all underscores is it's better to have more information. So I think it's, I think it's almost required for older lifters who start a strength training program, older, older individuals who start a strength training program to get a smart scale and to monitor their body composition and not just their body weight. Now, the poor man's way to do that is to, you know, is like Andy Baker says, like your pants should get looser and your shirt should get tighter, right? If you're a male, that works, but what if you're not a male? Um, so uh, I, I like for people to get a smart scale and to monitor their body weight, to monitor their body composition and see what's happening to their lean body mass and to their, and to their fat mass, and at the same time, to be monitoring what's going into their body. Right? So people say, yeah, I think I'm getting enough protein. Well, how much are you getting exactly? And people don't know the answer, the, right? The first step to all of this, again, is paying attention to what you're doing already. Don't make changes right off the bat, right? Be exactly. more cognizant and aware of, of but, what's but, happening. But quantify with. it. Part of the power right. of the barbell prescription is, is very quantitative. It's not like other forms of exercise where your coach or your guru says, wow, man, your key is much more luminous today or, what, or your form is so much better. No, man, like our people here, they know what they're getting, right? All they have to do is look at the numbers in their log to mm -hmm. tell whether or not they're getting what they're paying for, right? Because it's it's quantitative, it's very rational, it's very scientific. The same should be true of your nutrition. 
and, and your body composition goals. So start by getting some data and, and, and monitor that data. You're a lifelong physiology experiment, N equals one. I don't have anything to add. That's, that's You're next. Right. All right, next question. Steve Krogan. I'm I sure see. we're going to butcher every name on here, so I'm just <laughs> going to say I, I apologize in advance. I think you're, I think you're down with Steve Krogan. Uh, let's see here. I injured my hamstring while deadlifting a couple months ago. It was on the second rep of the first step-down set after a 90% single. I was warmed up properly and doing fine up to that point. Saw the MD who sent me to the PT right away, no imaging done. The physical therapist palpated a ridge at the attachment on the ischial tuberosity, which I'm pretty sure is not good. I wasn't aware of any acute pain there or problems deadlifting prior to the injury. It just popped and hurt. We always hear that, right? That it just popped. My question, was this possibly an overuse injury? If so, is it common for that to occur without warning? Or is there usually some prior indication how to avoid this happening again? Cheers, Steve. Thanks for your question, Steve. I have a lot of questions here. <laughs> um, it's, sure, it could be from overuse. Um, it's, it's difficult because there's, there's context that would maybe inform us a little bit more. But uh, I wonder how much you're yanking the bar off the ground, uh, kind of like in our form, form check, video that form we check just video did. that we just did. Yeah, um, I wonder if things are, uh, if, if your body is completely stable and static as you lift the bar. Um, again, I would think not. Uh, the big thing is if you feel some pop in your back uh, and then pain, something moved while you were under load at some point. We don't know where, again, like we said in the form check video, we don't know where exactly that pop happened. Um, but something moved if, if that happens. Um, or which, failed. Right. There was either some sort of movement that you don't right. want or there was some sort of structural failure. Uh, that means that your system was not in a stable position before the effort began or it, or it failed to maintain that position once it started. Or, again, as we noted on the, during the form check video, maybe Steve did everything perfectly right and just, it's just something. a shit happens yeah. kind of thing. Right. Because um, it does. So sometimes that just happens, right? Tweaks, tweaks can happen. Uh, I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? All right, so... Um, if, if there was enough of... What do you, what do you think of this... Um, what do you think of this ridge at well, the attachment? Yeah, so, yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll get to that. Um, um, the second rep of the first step down after a 90% single, um, I'm all in favor of uh, back offsets or yeah. drop sets. I'm all in that's favor a of those. That's, it's a, that's, that's a huge part of the way I train people. But um, the problem is, and we talked about this on the form check video, you brought this up on the form check video. Um, people get that 90% single or that heavy single target that they're, and then they do the drop sets. Like, I'm good now. I'm just gonna right. lie. I'm just gonna. This feels light. This feels light. I'm just gonna, <laughs> right? I'm just yeah. gonna, I'm just gonna uh, pump these out. You gotta, you got to approach every, single rep you do with the same degree of care and intensity and technical precision that you put into that into that heavy single attempt. So make sure that you're doing that. Clearly, if you got the single at 90%, you were warmed up properly, you say you were doing fine at that point. Okay, fine. Uh, uh, once again, it'd be nice with these questions and form check videos to know exactly at what point in the execution of the movement you felt your discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, uh, he sent you to the PT right away, no imaging then. That's not inappropriate, right? He had a, he had a tweak. He had some sort, of, some sort of minor thing in a hamstringish area. Again, I think without imaging, even with a medical education to say that it was your hamstring, increasing. Who knows? I, I'm, yeah, I'm a doctor and I never get this right. You know, I just went to the, I just went to the doctor about my knee because my knee's hurting. Yeah. It's hurting right over the medial compartment. I was like, yeah, that's medial compartment arthritis. I've got joint space narrowing, I've got cartilage loss. It's classic, it's classic. I've got joint space narrowing in the medial compartment. I've got, I've got osteoarthritis in it, except I don't. 
right? I've got a 35-year-old knee on x-ray. I've got a tear in the medial patellar retinaculum on, on exam and on ultrasound, right? So I was wrong. I'm a freaking doctor. I can't, don't try to diagnose yourself. Don't try to, right? Don't try to come up with a structural diagnosis. Like, just like, I tweaked my knee. That's good enough. I tweaked my butt or my, you know, upper hamstring area, right? As for this ridge at the attachment on the ischial tuber, I don't know if you got this, Damien. Like, the, okay, well, so uh, maybe. Hang on. Slide it in. Yeah, just let me just slide it in, right? So he, we, we got Scully here, and here's the ischial tuberosity where the hamstring attaches, right? And uh, it's got more ridges than a Ruffles potato chip, right? Of course it's got a ridge, right? And your PT, unless you already had a deeply intimate and personal relationship with him, doesn't know how long that ridge underneath your butt there has been there. For all you know, it's been there since, you know, um, you were born, right? Since the big bang. So uh, uh, that could be an in utero ridge for all you know. So the fact that he feels a ridge there um, doesn't mean anything. Now, if it's tender, that would be more indicative that maybe the ridge has something to do with it. Maybe you've got a little area of... Um, tendon there that's inflamed where the right. where the hamstring originates this is where the hamstring originates right so um your question this is possibly an overuse injury sure it's possible maybe right um no way to know without us like doing an in-depth analysis of your log was it a technique injury po maybe. possible maybe <laughs> yeah. again Impossible to know without uh, actually looking at form check videos, and maybe even with form check videos, it might be impossible to know. Um, is it common for this to occur without warning, or is there usual, usually some prior indication? Yes. It can go either way, yeah. right? We, it's just, you know, welcome to having a body. It just kind of sucks sometimes. So, yeah, sometimes this stuff happens out of nowhere. Other times, it, you've got a little red flag there in the back, like, God, that's a little bit sore and tender back there. And then it's a judgment call. Do you keep training? Do you right. rest it? Like, what do you do? Do you deload? It's a judgment call. Which is nice for having a coach. Yeah. Or at the least, a training partner, right? Someone else that you, to can, talk sense to you, that you can bounce that idea well, off of and make sure that you're not being reckless. Because right. I don't know about you, but I know that for me personally, I just push through everything. Because I think that those things don't apply to me. And then and I sometimes you're it. sorry. <laughs> I pay sometimes for you're it a sorry. Lot. And finally, how to avoid this happening again? Well, uh, one way to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again is to stop training and go whack yourself. Um, but short of that, what are you going to do, right? I mean, double check your form with videos that you take of yourself lifting. Listen to your Maybe body. Maybe you won't see anything. Maybe you will. Maybe you will, you'll see, uh, like what you said about a back offset being, you know, the hard part's over, I can relax a little bit right. and just zip these out. Um, Maybe you'll notice something like that and it'll give you a little bit of insight into your technique. You can fine tune it a little bit. Beyond that though, um, even if there is a ridge that developed from this injury, I think one of the best things that a lifter can do is really just focus on what can they do now, right? Like how can we fix this? How can we move forward? What range of motion doesn't hurt? All of those things that uh, don't require a diagnosis anyway. So don't worry about the diagnosis so much. Just, you know, see how you can move forward. Just rehab that. it. And there are really good approaches to rehab. Uh, we've got videos on this channel about, you know, what you can do and try next. It's always good to have a coach to help guide you through this kind of process. Uh, it's good to have a PT who's hip to what we do uh, and understands what we do. Uh, I, if this happened to me, I would do a 135 protocol on it, I would, right, which is just as straightforward as it gets. I would rest it for one or two sessions, and I'd come back in, I'd start super light, I would titrate up to a weight that just began to bother it if I was able to do the movement at right. all. And then I would take 20% off that weight. I would do a single at that weight, I'd take 20% off, do a triple if I could, I'd take 20% off that, do a five if I could, done, right? Do the same thing again and again and again, try to add weight, but you might not be able, you might have to take weight off 
of what you were able to do that first time the next time, right? Just go to a weight that you can do today, mm -hmm. do that first single, right? Don't let it get to the point where it's really, really hurting. Get to a point where it's just talking to you. I don't care how light that is, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you did this at Or three, how slow that is. Or how slow it is. If you, do, if you sustain this injury at, at 350 pounds, right? And you come in next time and it starts to hurt at 185, then it starts to hurt at 185 and that's your single. And you take 20% off that bar, right? And you do a triple, if you can, and you take 20% off that bar, and you do a set of five, and then you're done. And next time, maybe you get 200. Maybe you get 175 next time. It doesn't matter. Right. This, but this approach, this 135 approach to rehabbing injuries, it works really, really well. Is it the fastest? Is it the best? I don't know. We don't have studies. But it's what I use, and it works really, really well. Right. So um, avoid it happening again. I, nobody here gets out alive. Thanks again for your question, Steve. Thank you.